Hey guys, this is Dr. Colin Zhu, and thank you so much for being here with us on the Thrive Bites podcast. This is season four, and we're so excited for you to be here. Uh, for those of you who don't know me, my name is Dr. Colin Zhu, double board of in family and lifestyle medicine, and I interview the best and most passionate health and wellness experts of the industry on this platform. And we talk about plant-powered living, emotional resilience, and creating a thriving mindset. And this season, we're taking it live, we're taking it on multiple platforms, and we're taking it as a Q&A discussion as well as our interviewing of our guests. So we're super stoked about this, and please remember to like and subscribe down below, and we will see you. Welcome to the next episode. Okay, guys, welcome to the Frybots podcast, and thank you so much for being here. I'm your host, Dr. Colin Zhu, and thank you so much for spending your time to be with us here today for season four, episode three. And uh, I am super excited to have uh, these two next guests uh, coming on board, and I'm going to introduce you uh, really quickly. We have first the lovely Dr. Michelle Dang, and she's a board certified um, anesthesiologist and pain management physician. And she's also fellowship trained in integrative medicine. She's a certified yoga instructor, as well as a Legree certified trainer. Um, the next lovely Dr. Michelle Quirk, and she is, uh, she discovered her running, um, pretty much that changed her life. And she has a wonderful story. I'm gonna allow her to share that. And uh, she's basically a certified run coach uh, with the Roadrunners Club of America, a local girls on the run coach and a Disney world loving marathoner. And she is the founder and CEO of Mindful Marathon. So without further ado, please welcome both Dr. Michelle's. Hey. Hi. <laughs> Hi. Oh man, this is going to be interesting. I'm going to have, you know, <laughs> the three of us and both of you guys on the screen and a lot of uh, swap rows. So how are you guys doing? Really good. Nice to see good. you. <laughs> Great to be here with you. <laughs> oh, thank you so much. So I can't, you know, wait. Um, well, we're here. So, you know, we've definitely been on a journey for, uh, well, not only because we, you know, each one of you guys have, you know, we've worked, you know, together for, but, you know, but you're, your contribution and your passion for, you know, fitness, you know, you guys are already busy enough and, uh, you know, for you to kind of dedicate, you know, um, on the side, you know, I don't even know if it's on the front, on the side or on the other side, you know, but, you know, you still have a uh, great passion for, and, you know, I really appreciate, you know, you giving back and I love, you know, other people that, you know, live life and live, uh, you know, their work, through their own examples. I really appreciate you guys doing what you do. Thanks. Yeah. I mean, fitness is a part of our life. I think I can, I, I speak for myself, but I know this, I I've talked to Michelle Quirk and I know that it is, it is just, it's part of what we do. It's, it's like, I, don't, I can't imagine my life without moving my body somehow. Yeah, Same. definitely. Same. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's wonderful. And I think, yeah, all three of us definitely, I don't know your functional fitness uh, pillar I think we mm -hmm. definitely live, we live that for sure. <laughs> definitely. Well, let's get uh, straight into it. Um, so basically for those of the audience members that, you know, are watching, um, you know, don't know individually, you know, of you guys, you know, I definitely want to introduce each one of you and share your story and how you came about, you know, you guys have, you know, already super busy with your own professional careers, but this transition and this, uh, convergence of both of them and the, you know, the, the blend, you know, it's kind of like a stream of water, you know, and two streams flowing into each other and somehow they just, you know, transforms and I love it. You know what I'm saying? So let's start with, uh, you know, Dr. Quirk, you know, let's uh, start with you and uh, tell us about your introduction and how you got from you know, here to there. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Or there to well, here. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was not always a runner. That's really the beginning of the story. I was not an athlete growing up. And I really, as you know, I struggled with the mile run. And um, yeah, just what was not a runner at all. I used to look at the cross country team and think that maybe they were made of a different uh, genetic material than I was. But <laughs> I huffed and puffed my way around and um, just never thought I would be a runner. 
And about like nine years ago now, um, I j had just finished my residency and, you know, was going through a rough time. I moved to a new place, started my first attending job um, as a pediatrician. And, um, you know, at that time, my dad was diagnosed with lung cancer. And I found myself in a really rough place between all of this um, newness at work and, you know, studying for pediatrics boards and all of this. And I finally, I, I thought to myself, I'm not living a really great example for my patients. Like I, I'm saying to exercise, I'm saying to really love fitness, but here I am not really taking the best care of myself physically or mentally. And so I just decided that it was, you know, enough is enough. And I'm, I'm really going to try to run for, you know, probably the hundredth time because I tried it so many times before <laughs> and quit so many times. But um, that's what really did it. Like that period of time in my life, I, I started running around the block where we lived like five minutes at a time. And I found that it could um, like clear all of the the thoughts that were going on in my brain and kind of help me through everything else that was going on. Um, and that's how it started. And I signed up for my first uh, 5k. I had wanted to run like a local 5k for a very long time, but had made a lot of excuses and put put that off for, for such a long while. And I decided that that's what I was gonna do. And after that race, man, I was hooked. <laughs> I just, yeah, I, I don't know if it was the, the finish line, the runner's high, call it what you will, but um, I worked my way up from there to half marathons and, mm -hmm. and marathons and uh, was so inspired by the sport um, and my own coach that I ended up coaching others. So that's kind of how I went from not a runner to a runner. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, I can. Um, thank you so much for that. I mean, I can definitely, you know, relate in in the fact that you know I still run. Um, personally, I started with triathlons in '06. Um, been athletic most of my life. Uh, did a little basketball, a little track in junior high, uh, little martial arts, and I did triathlons in like '06, and then just kind of grew and just you know melded everything else. So. Uh, I think I have a 10K coming up this Saturday, so I'm pretty excited for it. So, but I, I, I get what you're saying because it's, it is a runner's high and you do it in conjunction with other people. Um, I know you, Dr. Dang, also do it with you know, your community. Can you share your story of how you got into it? Sure. So running is, um, I have a love-hate relationship with running, and but I do love finishing. I love the feeling that of accomplishment I get after I run. And so somehow I've made it through, I don't know, eight half marathons, seven, eight half marathons, a full marathon, and I don't know how many 5Ks and 10Ks. But in terms of my fitness journey, like Michelle, I didn't really grow up um, really um, being athletic at all. Maybe I played some volleyball, some soccer growing up, but really did absolutely nothing um, up until after I had my son, whose name is Colin. Um, and I had him, he's 12 years old now, but, um, I did not really have necessarily a healthy pregnancy, um, was not really focused on my own personal health or, or wellness or fitness. But after I had him, maybe about, um, he was about one or two years old. I just felt really just overall just gross. Like I just was not moving myself at all. I hadn't, I had gained all this weight from pregnancy, didn't lose it at all. I, during that time, I think Groupon or Living Social was really big. And so I got one of those boot camp, six week boot camp classes. And then I started feeling so much better and um, just feeling more confident in myself and my body. And that was literally when I got hooked. And that was probably around 2011. And um, from there, I kind of just never looked back. I started all sorts of different fitness classes um, from pole aerobics to yoga. But probably in the year 2014 was when I really had a lot of personal stuff going on and started practicing yoga regularly. And I saw how much of a difference it felt for me, both physically as well as spiritually and mentally that um, I wanted to do complete my yoga teacher training. So I did that in 2014. And then 
um, practice yoga probably daily um, for years after that. But then I just wanted to do more. Like, you know, it kind of is addicting, similar to the runner's high, where the more you, you kind of work out, you start like seeing the change in your body, seeing the change mentally that I just started kind of going a little bit crazy on the fitness aspect of it. <laughs> um, and I started doing class pass, uh, which you can kind of take a variety mm. of classes. So, I mean, it was not unusual for me before the pandemic to do like three classes a day and want to keep doing it. Um, but anyways, but um, then from there, I found Legree Fitness, which is a high intense, low impact workout on a machine called a Megaformer. And I'm very proud of you, Colin, for calling it Legree. I think the first time we did the podcast together, <laughs> Colin was like, Legra. <laughs> <laughs> it looked French to me. I was like, Legra? Or... <laughs> well, the creator, uh, Sebastian Legree, he is French, but um I mean, maybe that's how he pronounces the name. I have no idea. Yeah, um, we should go ask him one day. We should ask him. <laughs> um, so I started taking Legree fitness classes pretty regularly, saw a huge change in my body. Um, it was much stronger. My core was a lot stronger. And so that was when I shifted and started practicing Legree much more regularly and then became Legree certified. So currently I teach Legree fitness. And I practice it as much as I can. Um, I have a home microformer, which is a home Legree machine. And um, I just love just all sorts of different kinds of fitness. Um, I encourage everybody to try a little bit of everything. Um, and I started a fit female physician group on Facebook. And we have, I think, close to 4,800 members right now, which is crazy. And I know Michelle Quirk is in that group as well. And that's like super fun for me. I mean, my passion is just getting people motivated and inspired no matter where you are. And there's a season for everything. Um, you know, yoga was my season for a long time. And then I shifted now to Legree Fitness. And that may change as well. But I think the important thing is just to keep moving. myself muted. Uh, no, no, that's awesome. And uh, what I love about that, you know, story, Miss um, Deng, Dr. Deng, is the fact that you did not stop uh, cherry picking or picking the one that really spoke to you. And I think, you know, this episode is basically, you know, the essentials of, you know, uh, to start moving your body, right? And what I find with physical activity, and we're all physicians here, is that, you know, and, you know, having people and counseling people and coaching people to move more is not enough, right? And um, I, you know, always say to patients, you know, I don't care what you do, you know, as long as you do something that was enjoyable. So I guess a question to both of you, you know, Dr. Cork, I'll, you know, go to you first, is, you know, how, you know, if it wasn't running, you know, how would you, uh, I guess, uh, tell people, um, you know, to not give up, you know, because I'm sure you've had um, either patients or clients or just maybe friends and colleagues that, you know, just, you know, don't want to move, right? So how do you tell them to, you know, don't stop, you know, it's kind of like, you know, looking for something you know, like, and you'll find it, you know, when, when you see it, you know, um, Dr. Dan, you said like you felt it, right? So, you know, Dr. Cork, like how, how do you come across those situations when you have a, you know, a, a soul that's like, I need to move. I know I need to move, but you know, like, how do I get from point A to point B? Yeah, I have I have a lot of friends who who tell me all the time like I love what you do but I'm not a runner and I can't do that and I say that's fine. <laughs> you you have to find what works for you, but um, finding the something that really makes you feel good will help you to stick with it. So one of the things I always recommend I just I just say start small and that could be walking. Like if you're coming from the couch just setting a small goal to walk the majority of the days of the week for five or 10 minutes, you know, at a time, it's a place to start. Um, maybe the ultimate goal is like that you would like to go hiking, maybe you like to be in nature, um, really just any kind of movement and finding that. So I definitely encourage this with my patients too. Like, obviously not, not all of my pediatric patients are, are runners or like to run, but there are so many sports out there and so so many um, aspects of fitness. But really for, for people coming from the couch or people who are really struggling with motivation, just walking, like a simple walk plan. I've been writing like prescriptions for walk plans for years <laughs> for the kids at work um, and friends and family. But, but yeah, starting small is really the key. Everybody wants, you know, an overnight success, but 
but lifestyle change really happens mm. um, more gradually and more slowly. And you have to find something that you really love to do so that you keep wanting to do it. <laughs> Oh, you got to share this prescription. How do you write a prescription for oh. the kiddos? <laughs> <laughs> I, I basically, like, I love to write training plans, right? So I make like a little grid, you know, and we're going to do day one, day two, day three, and walk, you know, five minutes Monday, five minutes Wednesday, five minutes Friday, and I write a little plan. Oh, wow. That's so cool. <laughs> I, I'm imagining like a little spreadsheet, like Basically, a little Excel yes. file, right? Yes, and yes, it's like that's, column A. <laughs> yes, that's how I write my training plans. So I just kind of adapted that for, for walking. Oh, wow. <laughs> uh, Dr. Deng, how do, you, uh, how do you get people, you know, how do you get those people that are like, uh, I'm not really <laughs> sure. Um, you know, I'm not flexible. A, a what? A mega what? You mean a transformer? <laughs> like, what do you, what? You know, how do you, how do you, how do you persuade or how do you like, you know, get them to do those, you know, quote unquote, small steps? And do you have your own version of small steps? Yeah. So like Dr. Quirk said, I mean, for, for me, it's a, uh, it's about sustainability. So I think um, finding, finding whatever it is that's sustainable for that particular person. And so I ask people, what do you like to do? So for a while I did Zumba too. So that's another thing that I did. <laughs> <laughs> I was actually considering getting Zumba certified at one point. Um, so uh, I yeah, love, I wouldn't be surprised. <laughs> so I love dancing and actually a side note, I, I was like, maybe I should look into doing that again. But um, anyways, um, I love dancing. And so for some people, um, they, they may, may not think dancing is a form of exercise, but it totally is. You can burn so many calories dancing. There are so many different options out there for dancing, not just Zumba, but other types of dancing. So I think finding something that they're interested in. Um, also, some people are really into like listening to podcasts or audiobooks. And so if they're really not into necessarily running, but they like listening to stuff, I mean, that's something that they can do. I mean, I know when I'm into like a really good true crime podcast, I like the running is so much better for me because I'm like, okay, I can dedicate 45 minutes of running or walking and listen to this one episode. And, um, and so it's not that bad. Um, so yeah, I mean, just finding something that's sustainable, but at the same time, um, I do have lots of friends who say, oh, I can't do yoga. I'm just not flexible. It's too boring. And, and I think that that comes from a place of just um, not really understanding all there is in that particular type of fitness. So yoga, mm -hmm. there's so many different types of yoga. It's not just a slow Hatha type of yoga. There's power yoga, Baptiste yoga, that's very fast paced and really, really challenging. Um, and in terms of, you know, them not being flexible, I mean, you know, you get more flexible by actually practicing yoga. Um, but I tell I tell my friends or, you know, my clients that um, especially if they're trying Legree Fitness for the first time, I got to tell you, like it took me five to 10 classes to really feel like I didn't have two left feet on the machine. And so it can be a little bit discouraging. So often I'll tell people if you're trying something new, especially a Legree class, um, try at least five classes and see how you feel. Af if after about five classes, you're just like, eh, it's not for me, then you're probably not going to be able to last a really long time with that particular mm -hmm. type of fitness. So I think it takes, you know, a little bit of time, a little bit of patience, but you know, if it's not for you, it's not for you. It's not a big deal. There's like hundreds of other types of fitness that you can do to continue moving. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I really like, um, you know, uh, we used to have, well, I think there's, I still, I still think they exist, you know, the group on, I don't know about living show, uh, social, I don't, uh, I don't, haven't used that before. And I know class passes is, is a very, you know, big one. And those are great options to be able to just, you know, you know, come in, it's kind of like college, right? You know, you check a class out, you know, you don't like it and you're like, oh, everyone's asleep. And then, you, you know, you come back out, yeah. <laughs> you know, um, just to kind of try it out because, and it's to trying. And um, I think what you said was, you know, was really important. The fact that, you know, five classes, I don't know if that's a magic number, you know, I guess it's this dependent um, on people, but, you know, just having at least, I would probably say at least like three classes to kind of get out the first day jitters. Um, maybe you need to go through a couple of icebreakers. You're just not sure of everyone there, you know? Um, so, I mean, what about you, Dr. Cork? I mean, how many times, you know, have you worked with a client um, that you said that mm, maybe, this is not really for them and, you know, maybe suggest like a different sport or a different, you know, coach or something like that. I'm not sure if you encountered that. Yeah, yeah, for sure. I think I would give it a month, like my brain thinks in, in four month, uh, train, like four month of uh, writing a training plan. And so I think like, 
we can kind of tweak things. Like usually at the beginning, if I have a new runner, the goal is um, finding someone's easy pace, like a conversation pace that they can sustain for a long period of time. And that, that can take a couple of weeks to figure out um, especially if you have someone who's been primarily walking and they want to make that transition to either run walking or running. And so it can take a couple of weeks, but I think people know by about three or four weeks in like, okay, this is working and it feels easier to me. And then I've done my job and then usually we can kind of take off from there, but, but there's definitely a period of time to give it a try. So you have to be a little bit patient, I think. <laughs> mm hmm. Mm hmm. Okay, cool. For that, for guys that are watching in, you know, just a reminder, this is Fitness 101 with the lovely, you know, Dr. Michelle Zdang and Dr. Michelle Quirk. <laughs> and we are talking about the essentials to start moving your body. So here's another question is, you know, when I counsel patients, you know, I don't personally coach um, uh, fitness, um, but when I'm counseling, you know, patients, you know, um, I find one of, one of, you know, one of these options work, you know, one, having a accountability partner, you know, having someone that's supportive, whether it's like another person or, you know, joining a community, a class um, before the pandemic myself, you know, I really fell in love with CrossFit because of the whole concept of, you know, community and, you know, community is part of, you know, our pillar to thrive. It's part of, you know, our social network. Right. Um, and then having the, having this external motivation, um, you know, people know that it betters their health but maybe don't think about it, you know, themselves. Maybe you have to refocus on like, well, Mr. Smith, you know, uh, why don't you focus on uh, thinking about making it to your daughter's wedding? You know what I'm saying? Uh, something like that as an external mo motivator. What has worked, you know, for you or has any, do you resonate with any of those? Uh, Dr. Deng? Um, yeah, for sure. So for me personally, part of my own motivation for starting my fitness journey was because I just felt so bad after I had my child and um, about myself and my health. And also I had a strong family history on my dad's side of heart issues, heart disease, high blood pressure, coronary artery disease. And so I wanted to decrease that risk for myself. I mean, you know, I just had a baby. I wanted to be around for my baby and be healthy. So that was definitely a motivation for myself. And then I think um, as I kind of explore different types of fitness, um, I think setting or having some sort of um, lifestyle goals in mind for myself. So for me, it was like, I really don't want to be on a lot of medications um, if I don't have to. So my goal was to be more cardio healthy. So that was when I started running. Um, and then from there, um, it was like my goal uh, later on <laughs> was um, to decrease my risk of osteoporosis. So then I added more mm. strength training. And so I think um, having those goals in mind and those factors that contributed to my own health and my genetics um, really was very motivating for me. So, I mean, I think that works for a lot of people. Mm -hmm. Cool. I like that. Having those, uh, looking back at your quote unquote, you know, genetics and family history, you know. So what about you, Dr. Cork? Yeah, I think what Dr. Dang said really resonates with me. Um, really, it's about setting some short-term and then long-term goals. And what's always um, helped me and helped my athletes is to think about your why before you start on whatever exercise journey it is. And kind of thinking, yeah, both, both short-term and long-term. So same thing here in our family. We have a history of diabetes and heart disease and high cholesterol and high blood pressure and all of those things. Um, and so, you know, making a decision from somewhat of a, a younger age that I am trying, you know, to keep those things at bay and not have to take a lot of medications and really set the example um, for my patients and my family. Um, and then, yeah, um, as you go along, of course, your goals change and, and that's okay too. Um, but I think really sitting down and figuring out what is your motivation to to start this process can be really helpful when when things maybe get tough or you you don't feel like going out for that walk or um, going out for that run. But maybe you're training for a, a race or a hike or a trip or, you know, I have to find out what what you're training for. <laughs> I think that's a helpful thing. Definitely, definitely. I think what helped for me over time was, um, you know, having that 
you know, competition, you know, factors. So, um, you know, I booked my first race in 06. It was actually on my father's birthday. It was my first race. And, you know, for those of you that's participated in triathlon and granted, it's not an Ironman. There's many, many different classes. So I started from the, you know, from the mm -hmm. beginning, I started with the sprint triathlon and, uh, you know, it's a bike, you know, psych, uh, it's a swim bike and, you know, running sequence. Um, and nothing is more humbling than, you know, being in the same sport or race and have a, and having a 75 year old and a 15 year old in the same race and they both beat you. <laughs> <laughs> nothing is more humbling. And, uh, and I remember distinctively another race later, um, there was a father, a young father, um, that brought his toddler, you know, through a triathlon as well. And I thought that was amazing. And that guy beat me too. So, um, so, you know, I think having a competition. So if you set a goal, like for an easy example is, you know, uh, finding a local 5k, you know, and having that competition, not necessarily to, you know, needing to beat someone else, you know what I'm saying? And it's cool to have a competitive nature. Um, you know, for me, I just wanted to have fun and be in the same space uh, with everyone else because that kind of like, you know, fueled me. Um, you know, when I did my first marathon in New York City, it was, man, over 50,000 participants from over 100 countries. And the amount of endorphins that you feel, <laughs> the adrenaline that day, it was so cold, but you just felt so warm because, you know, not just because of the body heat, but because of people were just so spirited, you know, um, you know, do you have any similar experiences, um, Dr. Deng? Yeah. So I, um, completed my first full marathon in 2019, January, 2019. And I did it in my Homeson. And that was so that I mean, I after I finished, I said, I'm never going to do a full marathon again. And then here I am like two years later, considering doing another full marathon. Um, and so yeah, I mean, it was it was such an amazing experience. And I have to say, if 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 people haven't done live races, I mean, of course, the pandemic kind of threw everything off kilter. But a live race is just so amazing, especially if you're able to do it in your hometown, because I was running by like my old college, I was running by my house. Um, you know, it's a great turnout in Houston this year in um, 2022 is our 50th anniversary. So it's going to and it's live. So um, there is just something to be said. I know uh, Michelle can <laughs> really speak to that, um, being a running coach. But yeah, it's just that can, the running community is amazing. I can't speak enough for it. Yeah, yeah, um, yeah. You guys talking about your marathon experiences makes me want to go sign up for another one right away. But, um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I, I know I, yeah, you probably do this like what back to back. You're probably crazy like me where you do like one weekend and then another weekend, another weekend. No, <laughs> no, 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 no. But I, but it's an exercise in restraint to not like sign up for a lot of races. And there, there's a way to to train so that you're not racing all of those so you know if if you're all about the races and the medals it's okay and and we can talk about that later on but <laughs> yeah i ran my first marathon in january of 2018 and i i don't want to say i had the opposite feeling as michelle but when i crossed the finish line i felt amazing and i wanted to keep running like if if my coach was there and said you know run five more miles i would have done it and i couldn't wait to sign up for another one. So much so that I got home from that trip and you know, I had to have a talk with my husband, like, okay, before you sign up for another one, just remember like, that was a lot of training, that was a lot of time, like, don't take it lightly. And I don't, you know, but but the marathon, it's it's an investment and uh, in in yourself and and in time, but it is it's an amazing experience. And the the Disney marathon was was awesome. It's really fun. Oh wow. I've heard that's a great one. <laughs> Do, do so any fun. of your significant, uh, do any of uh, y'all's like significant others uh, actually participate in either in a race or in the same sport as you guys? Oh my gosh, my husband's an Ironman. So when you were talking about triathlons, I was like, okay. So he, I think he did his full um, Ironman in 2014. 13 or 14. And he's done, um, you know, several half Ironmans. And so, um, Luckily, like I met him before I met him after he did all this. So it's a full Ironman is it's just on another level. Like I yeah. still every time he talks about it, I just can't wrap my head around it. Um, but but it took him probably like a year, right? To to train for one is my understanding. Um 
Actually, from what he told me, I don't know. I'll have to like. He probably said like a month, right? <laughs> he said He's that like, he, ah, a month. <laughs> he signed up on a whim, I think, and then he was like, "Oh crap, I really got to train for this." Um, <laughs> but you know, leading up to it, he did a, he did a lot of halves. So I guess like the halves were like training for the full. Oh, okay. um, but yeah, he's a big uh, cyclist and mountain biker and runner, and so he likes to kind of like try to be my coach when it comes to running. And I'm just like, I, I have, and this is where it kind of goes back to your goal. So my goal is never really to be like super super fast. My goal is just to finish and enjoy it because I'm doing it just to for cardio health. I'm not doing it really to be super fast, even though, you know, at some point, maybe down the road, I might want to work on my speed a little bit. But since I do so many other types of fitness, like running is one aspect that I, I include for cardio, running and biking is my cardio. And then I do all the other strength training. Um, so anyways, yeah. So he, he tries to like, you know, get me to be faster and has like this plan for me. And I'm just like, okay, I know, I know you're, you know what you're doing, but, <laughs> but let me, you know, I know what I'm doing too for myself. So, you know, it's a little bit of a squabble sometimes. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. <laughs> Dr. Quark. Yeah. My husband runs, um, but he is a lot faster than I am. And so, uh, we've we've managed to figure out a way to run together like for an easy run he just doubles back a lot <laughs> like we oh. leave at the same time in the morning and go up the trail and he'll go up a little further and then run back and so we, we do that and then for a long run we just kind of I want to say we run together but separately so basically we leave at the same place and come back at the same time but he covers a few more miles than I do and then we have breakfast <laughs> <laughs> What yeah, we're trying say? to get our 12 year old to um, to run. We actually signed him up for our running group. So all three of us are in the same running group. But my husband's nice. in the full group and um, my kid and I are in the half marathon group. But for a mm. while, like my husband, since since my we started getting the 12, our 12 year old to start running, he kind of uh, shifted his attention towards it, our, our son. And so because um, he's pretty fast, you know, kids aren't usually you can get them to run pretty fast. And so he shifted his attention from me to, to our son. <laughs> and so I was like, thank goodness. And then um, he was he was not here with us for a month during the summer. And so he came back and he was like not in running condition. So he's getting back up there. And I'm like, thank you. <laughs> you can leave me alone. <laughs> What do you say to uh, those that, uh, you know, maybe their spouses have, you know, maybe an opposing view or are not really wanting to participate or, you know, they're just kind of, you know, left to their own feeling a little bit alone in their, you know, physical activity journey or fitness journey? Like, what would you say to them? Like, maybe it's not a significant other. Maybe their best friend don't want to go or, you know, not really as supportive. What, do you, what kind of advice would you tell them? Uh, Dr. Cork? Yeah, I think uh, finding, again, going back to what what does that person like to do? Could you come up with a way, like if one of you is a runner and one of you is a cyclist, could you still go out together? Like if you wanted to try to do this together and spend time together, maybe you do it that way. Or you have a walker and a runner, um, and same thing, the runner can double back a little bit if you're trying to do it together. But I think you know, you're setting a good example. So even if your partner or your friend is kind of on the couch right now, you're you're still, you know, saying all the time uh, what you're doing with your fitness and you're a source of motivation and inspiration and you're setting a great example. So I don't know, I like to think maybe you're inspiring them, even if they don't go out and run with you or, or bike with you mm -hmm. or whatever it is. But um, but you're inspiring them, even if it doesn't seem like it. So keep doing what you're doing and hopefully the rest will follow. <laughs> I love it. Leaning by example, Dr. Dang. Definitely agree with that. I think part of it just is communication. So if it's like a significant other that kind of isn't really where you are fitness wise, I think just keep asking because maybe, um, you know, out of 10 times, maybe one of those times they'll want to go on a walk with you. And, um, and so I actually like for, I took a long break from running maybe about a year and a half. And during the pandemic, my husband and my son were running and I just didn't want to run at all. Like it just, had to run. And there are several times like they would always ask me like, come run with us. And I'm like, no. And then finally, one night, my husband was like, well, um, I got you a bike. <laughs> Like, can you um, come? Gifts bike work. Gifts work. <laughs> yeah, he was like, "Can you come bike with us?" And then you can be our water boy. So that was kind of like our joke. Like, uh, mommy's our water boy, and so I would bike with them. We only did this a couple of times. 
them and I'd have water bottles. And so then um, they're running next to me and they'll grab the water bottle from the bike. And so like, I have to say during that time, I was like, I really don't want to, but I'm kind of glad that they kept asking me and kind of pestering me because out of all the times that they did, I did come out with them and it actually was a really nice evening. It was um, really cool and um, had a nice breeze. And so I wasn't dying or anything. And I was actually like taking videos of them running. It was kind of fun. So I think keep asking if, even if you're not on the same page with, with the fitness and uh, just communicate why you're doing it. And um, one of those days it'll stick. <laughs> yeah, yeah, definitely. Guys, we're going to transition to the Q and a, for those of you that are watching, please know that this is a live stream. This is episode three fitness one-on-one essentials to moving your body. And we want to take your comments and questions. Um, so please type it up in the comment section and we will ask them live to both Dr. Michelle's. We're going to take a quick commercial break and uh, we'll be right back at it. Hey guys, this is Dr. Colin Zhu and welcome to Thrive Formula. I'm so excited for you to be here and to be just a little curious about what we do. If you know a little bit about my work, I created the Chef Doc in January 2017. And since launching it, I've written a book about thriving and hosting my podcast called Thrive Bites, where we've reached over 90 countries and counting. It's been a humbling and unexpected experience so far. The main driving force to create the Chef Doc was born out of the need to help others to combat chronic lifestyle related diseases such as high blood pressure, heart disease, diabetes, inactive physical lifestyle, and simply not being able to cook healthily. I noticed the same paucity and deficit within our medical school education and also within our medical training across the nation. My mother, who is a traditional Chinese medical doctor, taught me the values of compassion and empathy and looking at things in a very holistic point of view. I felt that I needed to practice what I preach and to lead by example. So I enrolled myself in a health supportive and plant-based culinary school and got certified in health coaching and board certified in lifestyle medicine. I've also adopted a whole foods plant-based approach for many years now. Currently, I take this same education to publicly speak and to hold interactive workshops and demonstrations across the country. 2020 for us, like the rest of the world, gave us a new set of challenges. Even with health disparities and racial injustice, I decided to look at things from a very silver lining perspective. And that meant, how do we become more resilient as a community? How do we pivot as a human species? Do I focus on me or us? Up until the pandemic, I've been grateful and humbled to say that I've been able to thrive in my own life. I've traveled and touched every single continent on the planet, visiting 35 countries from hiking up Mount Kilimanjaro to talking to king penguins in Antarctica to repelling off of waterfalls in Costa Rica to medically serving the less fortunate in western villages of the Dominican Republic and seafaring villages off of the islands of Cambodia. With so many different people and different walks of life, I realized that we're more similar than dissimilar. And to cultivate a thriving mindset meant a lot of self-work, self-education, and practical tools, but also in conjunction with other people. I could not be where I am without the support and foundation of others. That means right now, more than ever, we need to be unified and we need to thrive together. Therefore, I decided to create this virtual summit experience gathering and collaborating with over 45 speakers from different parts of the health and wellness industry to inspire, educate, and teach you the tools to thrive, not just in your own life, but also to those around you. And we will do this through the five pillars, what I like to call my five to thrive. Food as medicine, functional fitness, relationships, community, and resilience. I'm beyond ecstatic for you to be here. And the only question I would ask is, do you dare to choose to thrive in your own life? If you do, then come on in, let's learn together, and I'll see you inside. Thank you very much. All right, so we've been getting uh, some questions, but I'm gonna read off this uh, lovely comment. This is from 
Cherry Chu. Um, I think she commented, she says, I love that. I find kids get really excited to go hiking too. And I tell their parents about the All Trails app. I, I personally have, have never, I haven't used that uh, Oh app. my gosh, it's really helpful. I use that when we were in Colorado uh, last month. Um, we looked for different trails and found um, one in Boulder that we ended up hiking and it was amazing. So it's a really great app for like uh, to find different trails wherever you are. Mm, I gotta use it. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Dr. Core, have you used that app before? Yeah, yeah, it's really nice. I also like to over prepare, like if I'm going hiking, I like to know all the things like where to turn right, where to turn left on the trail, I get lost really easily. And so people will write their reviews of the trail and you can kind of plan ahead, it's nice. <laughs> it's pretty accurate too, because the trail that we went on was moderate and it was definitely moderate. Cause sometimes, you know, like you look at something that says moderate, you're just like, <laughs> oh yeah, it's probably not, but it's, it's pretty, pretty accurate. <laughs> Nice, nice. Uh, so let's uh, field some questions that people commonly, you know, ask you guys. And uh, Dr. Dang, I will uh, go with you first. Um, so, you know, you do yoga, you do Legree, right? And um, I think, you know, most common questions that people would ask is, you know, they just look at these I guess from their perceptions, you know, yoga, yogas or yogis, you know, are considered like contortionists, right? Um, and they're like, you know, why are they in a sauna and flexing into a pretzel all day long? And um, so the question, a common question would be like, uh, I'm not really flexible, you know, can I still participate, you know, in yoga? Why or why not? Yeah, so that is probably the most common question. Um, and Honestly, I think yoga for me initially was very intimidating too, especially in the day and age of social media, because you would see all these um, Instagram posts of beautiful people upside down doing one hand in handstands. And it's just like, I've never been able to do that. And that is not my goal. Um, but I think um, so the whole idea is just to um, use your breath to move your body. And so flexibility does not come natural for pretty much anyone unless you have, you know, um, yeah, Euler Danlos or something like that, where you're super, <laughs> super naturally flexible. Um, but I think um, that's the whole goal of uh, doing yoga is if your goal, um, if it's your own personal goal, right? So if your goal is to become more flexible, then definitely practice more yoga. Um, but if your goal in yoga is to be a part of a community where um, you can use your breath to move your body and, um, mm. and then, then that's, that's yoga too. So yoga is, is very different for everybody. So I think that's the most common misconception is that I'm just not flexible. So what's the point in doing yoga? But yoga is so much more than just flexibility. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, there's so many different types, you know, of yoga um, coming from different lineages, you know, you can probably spend a whole session just talking about, you know, different origins of yoga. And then it does include breath work, there's a, you know, just like meditation, there's, there's so many different layers to it, you know, right. um, another misconception is, is it just for women, you know, because is it because it's very popularly, you know, with the females, right? But can men also do it? Oh my gosh. I mean, if you, if you do look on Instagram, the hashtag like men who yoga or yoga, yoga men, or I don't know, like there's tons of men who do it and actually very strong men. And so I think incorporating yoga as a man, um, as part of your fitness routine is definitely um, to your benefit because it's a lot of core strength, which I've noticed um, with teaching Legree is that um, a lot of men don't really focus on their core. And so for Legree fitness, which is all basically core strength training, um, a lot of men do struggle a lot, like holding that plank pose for a minute. <laughs> um, and so it is, it is, it's kind of funny because I laugh whenever I have like my guy friends or, you, you know, my husband's taken my class like once and I, I laugh just because I'm just like, you know, seeing them struggle is, is, it, it, it's, it's kind of fun for me, <laughs> but no, I mean, um, you're like, I mean, yes, <laughs> I, it really is. When I had, I, I taught a birthday class for one of my girlfriends and all of our husbands took it with, um, you know, our, with the girlfriends. And it was so funny because all the men were like shaking and sweating and struggling. And the girls were like, whatever, we got this. Um, but yeah, I mean, it is, even though you find in yoga and in Legree fitness or reformer Pilates, it's predominantly women. 
Um, I think it's just because men think that they, I mean, no offense, Colin, but men think that they got to be in the gym, you know, CrossFit and all this stuff. But, you know, it is, it is, um, La Grie Fitness especially is really, really hard for, for a lot of men. So it definitely is not just a, a workout for women. Definitely, definitely. We'll definitely come back. Um, <laughs> Dr. Quirk, uh, a common question when considering running or maybe just walking, I'm sure you would get is how do you navigate what kind of footwear and or sneakers, you know, to try on? Do I go to, you know, any store? Do I go to like a specific running store? Like, how do you navigate that? Yeah, I think that this is probably one of the most common questions I get asked uh, by friends, family and strangers. But <laughs> I think, um, you know, everyone thinks that maybe I know a secret sneaker that you should get. But the truth <laughs> is, <laughs> the truth is that um, it, it's not as uh, exciting of an answer. But the, the sneaker that is my favorite and that works for me is not necessarily going to be your favorite sneaker or the one that works for you. And there's actually a lot of a lot of different aspects that go into it when you pick a sneaker. And so I always recommend to go to your local running store if you have one. I know if you, you know, if you live rurally, there might not be um, somewhere close. I live in Philadelphia and so there's a lot of great choices, but um, they, they know sneakers. They are sneaker experts and they will take your running history and figure out, you know, um, what level of runner you are if you're newer to the sport if you've had previous injuries, um, you know, changes in your form or your gait. So usually they have you run and walk on a treadmill in the store so they can watch, look at your foot and all these things. So, um, so, you know, I run in all different brands. There are types within the brand. Um, so yes, the, the short answer is go to the running store and, and talk to the experts over there and they will, they will help you out and get you, get you started. <laughs> Do you have any uh, running stores like off the top of your head that you would recommend that people can oh. probably Google around them? Yeah. Um, so I like um, here in Philadelphia, the Philly Runner or the Bryn Mawr Running Company. Um, and for a while, the Philly Runner was doing virtual fittings because of the pandemic. So even if you don't live in the city, um, you can talk to someone online, which is really nice. But um, a chain store would be... Um, Fleet Feet or Roadrunner Sports. Um, those are two big ones that are in a lot of cities. They will they will help you out. Fleet Feet, Fleet Feet. I really like them. So, yep. Nobody <laughs> wants to hear that to go to the running store, though. Honestly, oh. how many how many times have we a have has that question been asked? And every single time, so many. Like, Please just go to the running store. No, <laughs> and I nobody know. wants to hear that. <laughs> I think, um, you know, in the, yes, in the Facebook group, um, you know, we're, we're very pressed for time. And so it does take some time to out of your day to go and do that. Um, but a lot of, uh, a lot of my athletes are um, newer to running or they're beginners and they tend to be intimidated to go to mm -hmm. the store. So it's not like a time issue, but it's like, I'm afraid to go in there and say that I'm not, I'm not really a real runner or I do run walk. And so I know that I felt that way when, when I started and I thought, who am I to be going into the running store and asking for help? But the truth is that, you know, the running community is so welcoming and every runner started from somewhere and they really want to help you out. They want to set you up with a good pair of shoes so that you keep going back, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. And what is that quote or proverb? Um, you know, the the step to a you know a ten thousand foot you know journey or whatever starts with the first step or something. I'm butchering it right now. <laughs> but it's journey, true because yes. like yeah, because it's true because you have to understand whether you're a four foot runner, a mid foot, or a heel striker. You know, and you don't even know if you get shin splints or you have knee issues, you have patellofemoral syndrome. Like you don't know until you try it out, and it's worth investing in a good pair of sh uh, shoes, running shoes or sneakers. Um, you know, to prevent injuries, right? And then that could be a whole nother discussion in and itself. Um, Dr. Deng, um, another question that people would have is uh, how, you know, if I'm doing yoga, right, and I have like a bad back um, or have, and, and or some other injuries, can I still, you know, participate? How do I modify them or if I even, you know, need to do them? 
Yeah. So um, with my background as a chronic pain physician, I often get this question um, because a lot of times people, if they injure themselves, especially if they hurt their back, they think that, well, this. Uh oh. With an injury, you should still move your body, but you definitely, that's probably the most important thing because if you're not moving your body, you're, you're going to go put your body into more spasms. And so then when you do move your body, it's going to hurt even more. And then you're not, so it's just this vicious cycle. And so, um, just from my own personal experience, I herniate my back probably once every 18 months or two years. Um, but actually since I've been working out, um, in the past um, decade or so, I've not, it's not recurred as often. Um, so I tell people, if you do have an injury, especially a back injury, um, definitely take some time off, but then maybe like a couple of days, take some medicine if you need to, hot baths, whatever feels good for you at that time, but then get back into it. And uh, recovery, in my opinion, is different for everybody. But in general, I think um, starting slow, if you, if you do have a practice of yoga, doing something like uh, what's called restorative yoga or yin yoga, where it's gentle and really um, breathing and stretching into the pose, and then adding for back pain adding a lot of core strengthening exercises and so yoga is a lot about core strength pilates is core strength Legree fitness is core strength all of that will help strengthen your back so by strengthening your core you're strengthening your back and so it is a misconception when you do have any type of injury to just take some time off okay so if you sprain your ankle of course you can't like you know, work out on it but um, you know just in general be smart like the, about it <laughs> yes like just the general aches and pains that we all get as we get older um you know it it takes some time to have some body awareness to really know what the cause is and know whether you should move through it but if you are going to studio to work out, definitely many of the instructors are well-versed um, and know what you can do to modify if you have a specific area of pain. So if you have knee pain or ankle pain or, you know, back pain, then then they'll they'll show you different ways to modify. So, yep, keep moving. <laughs> <laughs> yes, keep moving. Don't stop. Yeah. Dr. Quirk, same question to you. You know, how do you navigate, you know, a client um, and or, you know, a patient if they have an injury? Do you tell them the completely stop or you know you also try to mo uh, modify for them as well yeah with running um i i definitely uh am more of a i would say conservative in terms of taking some rest days and and time to recover but that can mean that you know you may take off from running but you can walk um or do gentle yoga depending on depending on what it is like a lot of the time we don't want to be weight bearing if if something is is really hurting in our legs or our feet or our hips so um, usually I recommend taking a couple of days off of running and then if things feel better um, whenever you get back to it you start back with a very easy jog like a light a light run and see if things still feel okay and if they feel okay great and if they don't then you know it's time to pull back further but i'm a big believer in um active rest um dr dang was really talking about that but um with running um i'm definitely more of the rest and recovery so if something is hurting it is a sign that you might need to slow down um, and take a breath and regroup and rest so walking yoga cycling sometimes but but yeah, it's it's okay if you miss a run. <laughs> yeah, I always, you know, the road and the sidewalk and the track is not going anywhere. <laughs> mm -hmm. It'll yeah. definitely be there. Um, and all the races too. I mean, I've definitely been bummed, um, you know, because I have missed races and have to cancel them for whatever reason. Yeah. And there'll always be more races, more competition, more classes, you know, more yoga classes. So um, guys, this has been great. Um, I definitely want to conclude um, you know, we're coming up to an end here. Um, you know, I definitely want to highlight the both of you um, because you are, you know, teachers on the Thrive Formula uh, Masterclass Series. And I wanted you guys to kind of share, you know, what you have uh, contributed and what people can uh, get out of it. So Dr. Deng, I'll let you go first. 
Sure. So um, thank you, Colin, for having us on. And um, so currently what I have going on is I am, I mentioned earlier the Chevron Houston Marathon and Aramco Half Marathon. It's our 50th anniversary in January 2022. And I am so grateful to be chosen as one of the race ambassadors, which is super exciting. I mean, it's a huge race. And so if any of you are interested in signing up, Houston is always um, my favorite race to run. And I will be posting on the Chevron Houston Marathon Instagram page and our blog as well uh, in the months leading up to the I'm doing the I'm planning on doing the half marathon this year. Um, and I am pretty active on social media. I'm on Instagram at Michelle Ding MD. I also run a Facebook group, Fit Female Physicians, which I mentioned earlier, um, Dr. Pork is a part of. We have close to 4,800 members. That's all women physicians, medical physicians who um, have fitness as you know part of their life, part of their journey. And we welcome all women physicians wherever they are in their fitness journeys, whether they're just interested or whether um, you know, there are trainers or, or anywhere from beginning to end. So um, definitely you can, it's searchable on Facebook. So you can definitely look us up there. And as you mentioned earlier, I am a Legree fitness instructor. I teach at Fire Fitness Legree, um, which is a studio in Houston, Texas. I actually had one of the fit female physicians um, come take my class last weekend when she was in town. So super fun. I'm always excited to see people um, in person. And um, so, yeah, that's all I have going on right now. I have lots of exciting things that I will be posting about soon in the next couple of months. So stay tuned. Nice. <laughs> and what, uh, what, did, uh, what is your session about, you know, on the Thrive Formula for people uh, that are inquiring? My session is on... Legree Fitness and moving their body, I think. <laughs> <Sure>. <laughs> yeah, and hers, uh, she kind of goes into her background story, and uh, you've given us a, a, a wide array of, uh, you know, moves and postures, you know, and demonstrated that for us. That was, that was really, really nice. Yes. So thank you for that. Thanks. Uh, Dr. Cork, what do you yeah. have going on? And, uh, you know, speak a little bit about the session that you've contributed as well. Yeah, well, thank thank you, Colin. And um, thank you to Dr. Dang for being here. Um, yeah, the, the session in the, the Thrive uh, Summit was about how to get started with running, like very simple ways to get started um, with your running. And we kind of go into a little bit of the physiology of it and geek out a little bit. It's really fun. And then <laughs> there is a, a demo session where we do warm ups and cool downs and some very simple exercises for the core. So we can sort of get started with the core and then you can go and take Dr. Deng's class after that for, for <laughs> like level maybe one and a half. <laughs> but yeah, it was it was really fun. Um, and yeah, right now I am um, I do um, customized training plans and personalized coaching. So if you are a newer runner or um, getting you know back into running after a long period of time off, I would love to help you get back out there. Maybe you have a fall race that you're thinking about or that you've signed up for and had that oh no moment, like you need to start training. So <laughs> um, you can find me uh, on my website, which is mindful-marathon.com. And um, I have a YouTube channel, um, it's called Mindful Marathon, where there are lots of tips on and running tools over there and an interview series with, with other runners and experts on a lot of running topics. And you can find me on Instagram too, mindful.marathon. But that's what's going on over here. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. And uh, when this episode replays, uh, I'll be sure to include the links in the show notes, um, you know, so you guys could, you know, you know, watch out for that. So Dr. Michelle, thank you so much for being here. Um, you know, I really appreciate your time and your contribution to the physical activity slash fitness world. And, you know, pretty much a message to all you guys is please keep moving. <laughs> I hope this gave you a little bit of inspiration. So uh, please say goodbye to all the Dr. Michelle's. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, we're going to play this outro video and guys, we will see you on the next episode uh, next Wednesday at five uh, Pacific. And thank you so much for watching. Bye bye. Guys, thank you so much for watching that episode. We hope you enjoy it. And please remember to like and subscribe down below so you can get continuous updates for future episodes and future guests. And we can't wait for this upcoming season. So don't forget to like and subscribe and we will see you on the next episode.